Good morning. morning. Welcome to St. Paul's once again as we celebrate here in the season of Pentecost what God has done for us. We are looking at, once again, hard truths, and the hard truth today has to do with serving God and the temptation to serve money. We'll see that one is very blessed work that lasts a long time and brings true joy, and the other one actually can bring some difficulties. We'll reflect on that today in the service. We'll also celebrate the Lord's Supper today, so prepare your minds and hearts to receive the body and blood of Jesus. Now, this is a meal where we celebrate our unity in the faith, so if you haven't expressed that yet through church membership, please speak with me after the service. I'd love to talk to you about how you can commune with us in the future. We'll begin today with a hymn that, well, I'm sorry, we'll continue today with a hymn that celebrates Jesus and why we're here. Alleluia, sing to Jesus, hymn 169. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us 
and has given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We ask for God's continued mercy. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have mercy. For the well being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, Uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Lord God, you call us to work in your kingdom and leave no one standing idle. Help us to order our lives by your wisdom and to serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. You know, go to God's eternal word as we take a look at this idea of serving God or serving money. We see the, the great difference here and the joy that can come from properly focused in this regard. From Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Anyone who loves money is never satisfied with money, and anyone who loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is vanishing vapor. When goods increase, so do those who eat them. What profit then does the owner get except to see these things with his eyes? The worker's sleep is sweet whether he eats little or much, but a rich person's abundant possessions allow him no sleep. I have seen a sickening evil under the sun, wealth hoarded by its owner to its own harm, or wealth that is lost in a bad investment. Or a man fathers a son, but he has nothing left in his hand to give him. As he came out from his mother's womb, so he will go again, naked as he came. From his hard work, he can pick up nothing that he can carry away in his hand. This, too, is a sickening evil. Just as he came, so he will go. So what does he gain, he who works for the wind? Besides this, during all his days, he eats in darkness with great frustration, sickness, and anger. So then, here is what I have seen to be good. It is beautiful to eat, to drink, and to look for good in all a person's hard work, which he has done under the sun during the few days of his life that God 
has given him. For that is his reward. Likewise, for anyone to whom God has given wealth and riches, if God has also given him ability to eat from it, to enjoy his reward, and to rejoice in the results of his hard work, this is a gift of God. For the man seldom reflects on the days of his life since God keeps him busy with the joy in his heart. The word of the Lord. Second lesson is very similar here. The Apostle Paul tells us especially to focus on this one word, contentment, and what that can bring. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we certainly cannot take anything out. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be satisfied. Those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge them into complete destruction and utter ruin. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evils. By striving for money, some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pains. Instruct those who are rich in this present age not to be arrogant or to put their hope in the uncertainty of riches, but rather in God, who richly supplies us with all things for our enjoyment. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they are storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life, the word of the Lord. Now please stand in honor of the gospel. The gospel for today comes from Luke chapter 16. This will also serve as our sermon text for today. Jesus also said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager who was accused of wasting his possessions. The rich man called him in and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, What will I do since my master is taking away the management position from me? I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I know what I will do so that when I am removed from my position as manager, people will receive me into their houses. He called each one of his master's debtors to him. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, 600 gallons of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 300. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, 600 bushels of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 480. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the children of the light are. I tell you, make friends for yourselves with unrighteous mammon, so that when it runs out, they will welcome you into eternal dwellings. The person who is faithful with very little is also faithful with much, and the person who is unrighteous with very little is also unrighteous with much. So if you, if you have not been faithful with unrighteous mammon, who will entrust you with what is really valuable? If you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you something to be your own? No servant can serve two masters. Indeed, he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for the hymn of the day, We Servants Praise Our True King, hymn 341.
Grace and peace are yours from God the Father. Thanks to Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. The sermon text for today comes from the Gospel lesson in Luke 16. Let us pray. O Lord, open our minds and our hearts to your word so that we can understand what are true riches. Amen. When you go into training to be a pastor in our church body, they have you go what's called on vicar year. That's where you shadow a pastor for a year and kind of learn the ins and outs. When I was assigned to a pastor for vicar year, it was down in the Phoenix area. So Heather and I loaded up a, a big old yellow Penske truck. You know which ones I'm talking about. And we moved from Milwaukee all the way down to Phoenix. Well, there I was, about 35 hours in to driving this big old Penske, pulling a trailer with my little Mazda on the back even, getting closer to Phoenix when all of a sudden the road started going like this. And then it started winding around like this. And it kept going on and on. Elevation 5,000. Elevation 4,000. Oh, look, the third runaway truck ramp. That's comforting. <laughs> Elevation 3,000 and so on. It wasn't exactly an easy drive in a big old Penske. But you know what else? It's a beautiful drive. If you've ever made it, you know what I'm talking about. But how wise do you think it would have been for me, as I was driving, to look out the side of the Penske window and be like, wow, those mountains, really beautiful. Wow, look at those layers of red clay. They don't have that in Wisconsin. Wow, look at that tall cactus. It's twice my height. If I would have done that, I certainly wouldn't have arrived in Phoenix safely and probably wouldn't be standing here today. No, in order to arrive safely there, I had to keep my eyes focused on my destination. That's what Jesus is trying to impress on us here in this parable of the shrewd manager. Jesus wants us to keep an eternal focus. The parable of the shrewd manager is a very difficult parable. In fact, some say that it is the most difficult parable in all of Scripture. You have this rich man who is so rich that he doesn't even have to take care of his own finances. He, he hires that out to a manager to take care of everything for him. But then he finds out that this manager has been wasting his possessions. And so he calls him in essentially to fire the manager and to say, give me an account of your management. Well, the manager finds himself in quite the pickle. So he takes a second to think about it. What's he going to do now? Well, he can't dig. He's not strong enough for that. He can't beg. He's too ashamed to do that. Then it dawns on him. He knows what he has to do. For the sake of his future, there's one thing that will work out better than anything else. That's for him to be welcomed into other people's homes. For them to take care of him. But how's he going to make that happen? How's he going to get buddy-buddy enough to where people almost have to welcome him in there, almost like they owe him? That's when he realizes what he has at his disposal. He's got a little bit of time. He still has to give that account of his management to his master. And he also still has his master's ledger, the management books. And so with singular focus on his goal to be welcomed into other people's homes, the manager springs into action and does what he has to do. He calls in each of his master's debtors one by one. He has them lower the amount that they owe his master in their books, and then he matches it in his master's books. He does that over and over and over again. So with complete focus on his goal, he does what he has to do with what he has at his disposal to ensure that goal, to be welcomed into other people's houses. He doesn't waste time. He doesn't get rid of what he has. 
He doesn't wallow in sadness. No, he's singularly focused and uses what he has for that focus. What does the master do when he finds out? The master commended the dishonest manager. He commended him? This guy just cost him a lot of money. Wouldn't he be angry at him? Why would he commend him? This is the first reason why this parable can be so difficult, because that is so far from what we would expect. The second reason is that Jesus himself, as he's telling this parable, is holding up this dishonest manager as an example to follow. Now, we know Jesus wouldn't want us to be dishonest. So why would the master commend the manager? Why would Jesus hold this man up as an example to follow? Here's the key. Jesus says that the master commended him because he acted shrewdly. Now, when we hear shrewdly, we usually think of it in the negative sense, right? So kind of conniving and cutthroat. But here, shrewdly is being used in the positive sense. It's being thoughtful and wise. And not just thoughtful and wise, but proactively thoughtful and wise. This dishonest manager recognized, was think, thoughtful about what he had. He thought about it, and he was wise in the use of what he had. He was proactive in using it to reach his goal to be welcomed into other people's houses. The dishonest manager was very good at being shrewd. In fact, the people of this world are, are really pretty good at being shrewd when it comes to their worldly possessions, aren't they? I mean, people of this world, the people who have a stake in this life alone, are really good when they set their heart on something in order to get something that they want. For example, somebody who, who really wants that new iPhone, that thinks about that new iPhone, that knows when that new iPhone is going to be released, who saves up money to buy that new iPhone, who is focused on that new iPhone, is going to be really good at getting that new iPhone. That person who thinks about having a comfortable retirement, who wants that comfortable retirement, who puts themselves in a good position, who saves up money to have that comfortable retirement, who is focused on that comfortable retirement, will be really good at getting that comfortable retirement. The people of this world are really good at being shrewd to get what they want in this life. What about Christians? Are we good at being shrewd to achieve our goals as Christians? Jesus doesn't think so. For the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the children of the light are. Jesus is saying that unbelievers are better at being shrewd than we are. You don't see Jesus holding up unbelievers as an example for us to follow very often. But he's right. They're better at being shrewd than we are. Why? Because someone who has a stake only in this world, is, it's really easy for them to stay focused on what they want in this world. For you and I, as Christians, we have a heavenly focus. It's really difficult for us to stay focused on our heavenly goals. It's because we have so many things that try to steal our focus away from that. Sometimes when we have to face persecution as Christians, our focus gets taken away on, then put onto our earthly well-being. Sometimes when we have to face pain in this life for something that had happened, our focus gets taken away now to our, our sorrows and our troubles. And sometimes, and sadly quite often, we can have our heavenly focus get stolen away and then put on our worldly possessions and riches, the things that we have in this life. In fact, that is the specific focus stealer that Jesus uses for application. No servant can serve two masters. Indeed, either, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Mammon is a special word for worldly wealth. It, it emphasizes the unrighteous aspect of it. You and I have this worldly wealth, and 
We really want nice things. We want to be comfortable in this life. We want those that we love to have nice things and be comfortable in this life. There's nothing wrong with wanting nice things and being comfortable in this life, except when that becomes your focus. You cannot serve both God and worldly wealth. If I'm driving that Penske and I'm looking out the window at those beautiful mountains, I'm not focused on my destination. If you and I are focused on our worldly wealth, now we're taking our eyes off of our path to our eternal destination in heaven and, well, we might swerve off and end up in a different eternal destination. That's the warning that Jesus is giving here, a very stern warning. You cannot serve both God and money. If you take your focus off, even a glance, even just a little bit, you're at risk of losing everything. That's what Jesus is warning against. And Jesus is really good when it comes to focus. He knows what he's talking about. You look at Jesus' focus. Did anything ever pull him away from the goal that he was trying to achieve? Nothing. Did persecution pull Jesus off of his focus from his goal? No. In fact, he used that persecution so that he could confront those who were persecuting him so that they could repent. What about suffering? Did that take Jesus' focus away from his goal? No. In fact, we know suffering was a big part of him achieving his goal. He suffered for our sins on the cross. What about worldly riches? Did that ever pull Jesus' focus off of his goal? No. Even when Satan tried to offer him all the world and all its riches, if he would just bow down and worship him, Jesus said, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus was focused not on serving both God and money, only God. Jesus remained focused because he knew that our eternal riches and our eternal life were at stake. Jesus, in his focus, was focused on you and me. All the riches in all the world did not compare to spending an eternity with you and me. So if there's anybody in this world who knows the benefits that can come from someone being shrewd, it's you and me. Because of Jesus' shrewdness, we are given true riches, the riches of forgiveness and everything that comes with it. That means along with it, we've been given an eternal destination. Now we know where we get to go. We get to go to heaven. And so now with our eternal destination, we can have an eternal focus And now it's our turn to do what the shrewd manager did. The shrewd manager was looking to go and be welcomed into other people's homes. So Jesus says, I tell you, make friends for yourselves with unrighteous mammon, so that when it runs out, they will welcome you into eternal dwellings. Jesus is telling you to do the same thing the shrewd manager did with everything that you have. And it really only makes sense when you take a look at it. Notice what Jesus says about the worldly wealth. When it runs out. Make no mistake, all of our worldly possessions, even our most favorite worldly possessions, will be gone someday. As Paul says in the second lesson, we brought nothing into the world, and we certainly can, can take nothing out. So, as you and I are here with these worldly possessions that are about to run out, it only makes sense that we would use it in a way that focuses on eternal things. Why not use this stuff that's about to run out to focus on eternal dwellings instead, not just for ourselves but for others? It only makes sense. What doesn't make sense is when we do the opposite. When I was four or five years old, I remember I had a dime. And my sister, who's five years older than me, came up to me and said, Brock, look, I have a nickel. Look, it's bigger than a dime. And I said, wow, you're right. It is bigger. It must be better. And so I traded my dime away for a nickel. 
If you and I looked at our finances and all of our possessions, I bet you we'd find something where we have traded a dime away for a nickel. Every single one of us has somewhere where we have traded true riches for worldly riches. The person who is unrighteous with very little is also unrighteous with much. So if you have not been faithful with unrighteous mammon, who will entrust you with what is really valuable? If you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you something to be your own? Does more of your money each month go to entertainment than it does to nourishing your faith? Does your, more of your attention go to getting that next big new thing that will be outdated in a year or two than it does to helping someone else have eternal dwellings? Every one of us needs to look long and hard at our possessions and our finances. And I think when we do, and when we have that eternal focus, I think we'll see we can do a lot of good with what God has given us. By being shrewd with our, earth, our worldly wealth and by remaining focused eternally on our eternal dwellings, we'll see that it's all worth it. Someday when you get to heaven, you're not going to think to yourself, oh, I'm really glad I watched that season of that show. You're going to say, I'm really glad I made church a big part of my life. When you get to heaven someday and your grandchild or your child meets you there, they're not going to say to you, thank you for buying me that new iPhone. They're going to say, thank you for giving me true riches. When you get to heaven someday and you have somebody walk up to you and say, hi, you might not know me, but what you gave in the offering that one day, that helped me come in contact with the gospel and I learned about my Savior. It made it possible for me to be here eternally. You're not going to think to yourself, boy, I'm really glad I had that next new big thing. No, you're going to say, thank you, Lord, for helping me be shrewd with my worldly wealth. Thank you, Lord, for helping me prepare for eternal dwellings. Thank you for helping me keep an eternal focus. We know that the things that we have in this life will only truly be meaningful if it somehow is focused on eternal life. So don't look at the mountains. Don't look at that tall cactus. No, instead, use your worldly wealth in a way that is focused on where you're going and help other people get there too. Keep an eternal focus. That's what really matters. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God that is true riches given to us by our Savior Jesus guard your hearts and minds through faith in him. Amen. We now confess our faith in what Jesus did for us according to the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead 
and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We bring forward the offering. As part of the prayer of the church this morning, we pray for those with health challenges. Diane Thompson, who's recovering from surgery, Barry Weirs, and Norma Rubick. We also pray for those celebrating anniversaries this week, Ben and Pam Hoth, Michael and Sherry Axelson, and Steve and Carol Parr. We celebrate with those who have birthdays this week, Ron Anderson, Fred Tauscher, Jeff Anderson, J.J. Johnson, Naomi Dow, Sylvia Horseman, William Peterson, Zaina Peterson, Marlene Kastenschmidt, and Jenna Langer. Join together in the prayer of the church. Exalted Savior, we praise and thank you for the riches of your grace you have lavished on us. Keep us focused on what truly matters in this time of grace and use us to the glory of your name so that others can enjoy the heavenly treasures you've secured through your death and resurrection. Great Physician, make your power known in the minds and hearts of all who are faced with health challenges this week. As they face their challenges, Lord, give their bodies strength and healing and bless the work of their doctors and nurses. Lord of armies, make your presence known in the lives of those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. Bring joy to their lives as they remember the blessings that you bring with each year. We make these requests confidently in your name, Jesus, and we join together in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now please stand in honor of the gospel and the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right with him, thanks and praise. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world. Let the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for the closing hymn, which is printed for you in the bulletin. Good morning again. Always good to worship with you here in God's house. Big welcome to our visitors today. If you get a chance, make sure to fill out a connection card. We'd love to connect with you. As a reminder, even communion services, the ushers will collect those on the way out. Bible study and Sunday school continue today. So last week we looked at the road to Emmaus. Now we look at Jesus' ascension and what that means and all the treasures that that brings for us. Church directories are in. So the 2022 church directories made it by the end of 2022, which is really good. Uh, you can find those on a table down in the church basement. Uh, if you ordered or if you took pictures, you have a copy down there for free. You can just cross off your picture. If you didn't uh, take pictures or submit them, then if you, uh, I think they're asking us a small fee for that one uh, just uh, to offset some of the costs then for that. So uh, those are down in the basement for you. Midweek study continues uh, this Tuesday and Wednesday. We're taking a look at there are many ways into God's presence. So that lie about God, and we'll take a look at the one way. And I think you know who he is. Lots more there in the news and announcements. Go ahead and check those out on your own. May God continue to bless you this week as you serve him with the riches he's given you. Sorry, Harriet. Sorry about that. I kept going a little bit. Please greet one another. (laughs) 